Charles II of England. Charles II of England, 1660 to 1685, was the King of Scotland, 1649 to 1685, before the restoration in 1660 also made him King of England and Ireland. Charles was a charming and easygoing monarch who took a keen interest in sports, science, and the arts. From the acquisition of New York to the Great Fire of London, his reign was certainly eventful. Charles returned the monarchy triumphantly to the apex of British politics and society with a magnificent coronation bedecked in the new British crown jewels. There were wars with the Netherlands, alliances with France, divisions at home over religion, and significant expansions overseas, particularly in India and North America. He died in 1685 and was, since he had no heir, succeeded by his younger brother, who became James II of England, 1685-1688. When Elizabeth I of England died in 1603 without an heir, James VI of Scotland, 1567-1625, was invited to also become the King of England as James I of England, 1603-1625. James was the first of the Stuart kings, and he was succeeded by his son Charles I of England, 1625-1649. Charles's battles with Parliament over religion, finances, and the power of the monarchy led to the English Civil Wars, 1642-1651, and his ultimate execution on January 30, 1649. Charles I's eldest son, also called Charles, was born on May 29, 1630 in St. James Palace, London. His mother was Queen Henrietta Maria, 1609-1669, the young sister of Louis XIII of France, 1610-1643. Charles spent most of his childhood at Richmond House, where he most enjoyed horse riding. After his father lost the Battle of Naseby in 1645, Charles was shipped off to the safety of France along with his mother. He grew up tall, swarthy, and saturnine, Canon 293, reaching an impressive height of 1.88 meters, 6 feet 2 inches. Charles seems to have been the very opposite of his rather straight-faced father. The younger Charles was charming, witty, and easygoing, and his passion for romantic encounters began with Lucy Walter, 1658, who bore him the first of many illegitimate children, James Scott who became the Duke of Monmouth, 1649. While the monarchy was abolished in England after Charles I's execution, Scotland was permitted to choose its own way. Charles's eldest son was made the King of Scotland as Charles II in February 1649, formally crowned on New Year's Day 1651 at Scone. Pro-royalists rallied around Charles as their figurehead, and so began the Third English Civil War, or Anglo-Scottish War, 1650-1651. The Scots had switched sides since they now considered Charles their best means of preserving the independence of the Presbyterian Church in Scotland and promoting it in England, something the Puritan-dominated Parliament certainly would not do. As it happened, Charles himself had no interest whatsoever in Presbyterianism, which he described as, a religion not fit for gentlemen, Cavendish, 324. In 1650, Oliver Cromwell, 1599-1658, led Parliament's new model army into Scotland to persuade by force that any hope of restoring the monarchy south of the border was futile. The two armies clashed at the Battle of Dunbar in September 1650. Cromwell won yet another crushing victory. The remainder of the Scottish and English Royalist forces met for one last clash with Cromwell at the Battle of Worcester in September 1651. Again, the parliamentarians won, and so ended the English civil wars. Charles was obliged to flee to France, but getting away from the battlefield at Worcester was no easy matter. The Scottish king had to first hide in an oak tree for a day near Boscobel House in Shropshire before he could, disguised as a humble servant, escape to the coast and then abroad. This escapade is the origin of the common pub name in England, the Royal Oak. Almost penniless, the king without a throne relocated to the Netherlands. Oliver Cromwell was made Lord Protector of England, Scotland, and Ireland in December 1653, and so he was head of the military state known as the Commonwealth Republic. 
Cromwell's authoritarian rule and imposition of Puritanism made many wish for the moderation and tradition of the old monarchy. When Cromwell died in 1658, his republic died with him. Cromwell had chosen for his successor his son Richard Cromwell, but he did not enjoy universal support. Following a march on London in 1660 and with the support of a Scottish army led by General George Monk, 1608-1670, the monarchy was restored with Parliament's consent on May 8. There was remarkably little political fuss, helped by Charles's promise of a free Parliament and religious toleration as expressed in the Treaty of Breda of April 4. On May 29, his 30th birthday, Charles was escorted to London, where he met cheering crowds in streets decorated with tapestries and flowers. Trumpets blared, and church bells rang. The monarchy was back. Parliament declared May 29 a public holiday, which thereafter became known as Oak Apple Day in reference to Charles's flight after the Civil War. In 1660, all of Cromwell's acts of Parliament were cancelled, and Parliament's new model army was disbanded. In the same year, Charles I was declared a martyr by Parliament and made a saint by the Anglican Church. Puritan Cromwell received an entirely different treatment. The vindictive king had Cromwell's remains exhumed from Westminster Abbey in 1661 to receive treatment as if executed as a traitor, that is the corpse was hanged and beheaded, and the remains were put on public display. There were a few executions of living men, but, generally, Charles was willing to forgive and forget the sins of the fathers. There were still, nevertheless, many open wounds within and without the Anglican Church and no sign of reconciliation between the opposing sides of moderate Protestants, various Puritan groups, and the Catholics. Charles favored a lenient approach to Catholicism, but Parliament, on which he depended for finances, took the opposite view. As so many times since the English Reformation, stories of Catholic and Popish plots abounded, notably one in 1678 propounded by the fantasist Titus Oates, 1649-1705, which he said planned to assassinate the king. Evidence was slim for these conspiracy theories, but a wave of persecution of Catholics in one form or another did follow as a result. There was one real regicidal conspiracy, the 1683 Rye House Plot, but it came to nothing. The debate over religion would simmer along right through Charles's reign and boil over in that of his successor. After the Civil War, the British crown jewels were broken up and sold off, but Charles II's coronation in Westminster Abbey on April 23, 1661 would have been a drab affair without some glittering baubles. Accordingly, an entirely new set of regalia was created, although some of the old gemstones were recovered and used in the new pieces. The gold St. Edward's crown was bestowed at the actual moment of coronation and has been so used in ceremonies ever since. The sovereign scepter, aka King's scepter, has also become a staple part of the coronation, although today it has the added sparkle of the 530 karat Cullinan diamond. The sovereign's orb, symbolic of the Christian monarch's domination of the secular world, was made for Charles and is a hollow gold sphere set with pearls, precious stones, and a large amethyst beneath the cross. Every British monarch since has held the orb in their left hand during their coronation. The new jewels nearly went the way of their predecessors. A villain called Colonel Thomas Blood disguised himself as a priest and tried to steal the regalia from the Tower of London in 1671. Upon hearing of the plot, Charles, impressed with his audacity, pardoned Blood in an example of the king's sympathy with audacious schemes whether they be scientific or criminal. 